I'm Simon Stevenson. I'm a postdoc at Swinburne University here in Melbourne. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to tell you about the implications of the red supergiant mass loss rates that we've been hearing quite a bit about the last uh, few days um, for the evolution of massive binaries. And in particular, I'm a gravitational wave astronomer. Uh, so this conference is maybe a little bit uh, outside of my normal topics. Um, but uh, so I'm going to focus on on the the implications for these these really massive stars and uh, uh, and for gravitational wave sources. Um, so so massive stars have high mass loss rates throughout their lives in various evolutionary phases, including on the main sequence uh, during the the red supergiant phase when they you know, finish hyd core hydrogen burning, expand to become these cool uh, red supergiants. Um, and for more massive stars and potentially stars in binaries where you have uh, interactions that can remove this hydrogen envelope and get these stripped wolf a stars uh, that also have very high uh, mass loss rates. Um, and so for each of these cases, uh, we can either kind of theoretically try to understand the mechanism that, that drives the mass loss and, and come up with theoretical models that predict what the mass loss rates should be, or... Um, we can basically go and observe a sample of this type of star and and come up with empirical mass loss rates. Uh, and so for both main sequence and wolf a stars, you can kind of do this theoretically. Um, the mass loss rates are understood to be kind of driven by uh, their line driven. Um, but uh, for red supergiants, uh, although people are starting to make some progress on, on theoretical understanding, it's still pretty hard. Uh, and most mass loss prescriptions that people use for red supergiants um, are empirical, as, we, as we've heard about um, this week. Um, yeah, so just to give a bit more context about my particular angle, why I'm interested. Um, so massive stars, I'm particularly interested in them as progenitors of black holes. Um, so what this plot is showing uh, is taken from a paper that we wrote uh, about the first gravitational wave event, GW15914. Uh, so the masses of the two black holes in that system are shown in the um, these horizontal colored bands. Uh, they were sort of both around 30 solar masses. And the colored lines, the solid blue line and the, the dotted red line, are kind of two simple models with two different assumptions about mass loss rates in, in massive stars. Uh, and as a function of metallicity on the x-axis, uh, what is plotted is the the maximum black hole mass that you would expect to form from a population of essentially single stars. Uh, and as you go to lower metallicities, um, this line driving on the um, uh, on metals in the envelope of these massive stars becomes less efficient. There's less metals there. Um, mass loss becomes reduced. Uh, so your star retains more mass. And so eventually when it collapses to a black hole, it can form a more massive black hole. Uh, at some point, you end up in this gray region at the top which is where the star's so massive, maybe it explodes as a parent stability supernova and, and shouldn't really leave a black hole at all. Um, but the point here is basically that, you know, in this strong wind model, which was from 20 years ago or something, uh, it basically never predicted that you should have 30 solar mass black holes. This is clearly wrong because we see 30 solar mass black holes. Um, but if you just reduce the, the strength of the stellar winds, then, you know, you can quite easily explain the um, massive black holes like that. So this is a plot from uh, a paper from Dessen et al. Um, from earlier this year uh, that shows a sort of compilation of uh, mass loss rates for red supergiants um, as a function of the luminosity on the x-axis. Um, and so the, uh, what color is it? The the blue and the brown lines there, the Diego and Neuenhausen um, lines, are kind of two kind of classical red supergiant mass loss rates that are often assumed in stellar evolution models and indeed in our um, population synthesis code that I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, we were using this prescription for red supergiants previously. And then at the bottom of this plot in the the red solid line from Dessin et al. and also the, the gray dash line from Emma Beza et al. Um, are sort of recent in the last few years attempts to derive mass loss rates for red supergiants um, from, uh, from red supergiants in, 
in star clusters where you have an estimate of the the age of the star cluster and so you can also kind of estimate the initial mass um and so you can kind of get like a mass dependent um red supergiant mass loss rate um and so what they glossing over all of the details what they basically find is that uh, these mass loss rates are much lower than they were previously being estimated to be um and uh, and lower than a lot of stellar evolution codes are, are assuming and using and so this can have some impact especially on this kind of right hand uh, side of this figure because basically the mass loss rate during the red supergiant phase is determining whether your red supergiant can basically retain its hydrogen envelope uh, or whether it self strips it loses its hydrogen envelope during um during this red supergiant phase and and goes back to the blue side of the hr diagram and becomes a wolf ray star and that can have implications for binary interaction for example determining you know how long the the star stays as a supergiant and whether it can interact with a with a binary companion uh, so just there's a lot of words on this slide but uh, i just wanted to flash up some of the um other um, groups that have been working over, say, the last five years on um, determining new mass loss rates for red supergiants. Um, many of these uh, people have been at this conference and, and spoken already about their results. Um, I just wanted to highlight essentially the ones that, that we're using. So I already mentioned that previously we were using this prescription from the 90s, from Neuenhausen and Diego. Um, uh, our current, we've now switched to this uh, prescription from Dessen et al. Um, uh, uh, that I just spoke about, um, and uh, yeah, and then there's a bunch of other. The thing that to sort of take away from here is that these samples of red supergiants are becoming much larger. So we now have thousands of red supergiants that um, people are deriving mass loss rates from, uh, and they're from a variety of environments. So a variety of different metallicities, from solar down to um, you know, sort of almost a, a tenth solar in some cases. And so that really allows us to probe the dependence of the mass loss rates on on not just luminosity and mass, but also metallicity. Uh, so we've implemented a bunch of prescriptions for massive red uh, supergiant mass loss, uh, also for updated prescriptions for main sequence mass loss rates, uh, and also some prescriptions for um, wolf ray star mass loss rate. Um, so these are new theoretical models from uh, Andreas Sander and Jurek Bink and, and collaborators um, in our rapid binary population synthesis code Compass. Um, I'll kind of explain on the next slide what Compass is doing in a nutshell. Um, but this is uh, kind of publicly available open source population synthesis code that we develop. Um, and uh, it's mostly been designed and used for studying gravitational wave sources, um, but is kind of increasingly being used to study other kind of po related populations, uh, including, for example, the luminous red novae that uh, that Ursula mentioned in a previous talk. So essentially, what Compass is doing is kind of this in a for loop, like a million times. So what we do is we start out with two massive stars, uh, you allow you pick some initial separation of and mass ratio of that binary, uh, and you evolve those stars through some kind of approximate rapid prescription that tells you how the stars evolve and how the binary uh, interact, how mass transfer occurs, how common envelope evolution works. Uh, and you go through this a lot of times, and a lot of binaries merge, or they're disrupted by a supernova or whatever. Uh, and very occasionally, maybe one in a thousand times or something, you end up with a binary that makes it through uh, this diagram to the bottom, where both stars end up forming black holes in a binary that is bound and bound with a short enough orbital period that the binary can merge due to the emission of gravitational waves and, and form a, a gravitational wave source. So, yeah, so now I'm just going to show a couple of slides of uh, kind of what we find from implementing these uh, new mass loss prescriptions in, in our standard models. So in these plots, the blue line is kind of our sure, uh, our previous um, model, which is labeled old. Um, the green line is the, our new kind of best guess of mass loss rates. Um, and the orange prescription here uh, is kind of a kind of worst case scenario where in, in each of these e evolutionary phases, We've basically tried to pick a mass loss prescription which is on the high end, and so we label that as a pessimistic case. 
Uh, so in this case, what I'm showing is the, the maximum black hole mass from a population of single stars uh, as a function of metallicity, with solar metallicity on the right-hand side now, uh, and metal-poor stars on the left-hand side. We see the same trend as before, where as you go to low metallicity environments, the, the, the black hole mass increases. At some point, you hit this parastability range where you can't uh, form more massive black holes, and so this kind of levels out. Um, there's not a lot of difference here, really, between the, the new and old prescriptions. Um, uh, this pessimistic prescription, particularly at the, the lowest metallicities, um, predicts uh, quite lower, um, has a much lower maximum black hole mass than, than the other two models. So one of the things that we're interested in is the formation of some of the most massive stellar mass black holes that we know about in the Milky Way. Um, so two examples of this are Cygnus X1, which is a high mass X-ray binary, uh, and Gaia BH3, which is a wide kind of non-interacting black hole binary observed by Gaia. Um, Gaia BH3 has a extremely low metallicity. It's actually off of this plot uh, on the left-hand side. Um, but uh, the black hole in that system is about 33 solar masses. Uh, and so our models, you know, reasonably consistent with forming this at metallicities below a few times 10 to the minus three. Uh, and the black hole in Cygnus X1 is kind of around 20 solar masses, um, but that system is kind of around solar metallicity, so it should be on the right-hand side. Um, and that, uh, we basically fail to produce black holes that massive, even in our new um, updated prescription at solar metallicity. So we typically have to go um, to a factor of a couple below solar metallicity before we form 20 solar mass black holes. Uh, and so this could basically mean that, you know, the evolutionary pathway for forming black hole systems like Cygnus X1 um, is is different to what well, this is for single stars, so different from, from that. We can then kind of do the same thing for now, instead of single black holes, for binary black holes, uh, so this is now the total mass of the binary black holes, so the sum of the two masses on the y-axis uh, as a function of metallicity. Um, as in the plot on the first slide, I'm showing the total mass here for GW5914, kind of just as a reference, um, showing that this uh, kind of forms, that, again, kind of metallicities of kind of 10 to the minus 3-ish. Um, uh, and yeah, you can, many of the trends are kind of the same. There's not too much difference between the old and new prescriptions in the kind of intermediate range, but you see kind of differences both at the um, metal pore case um, for the pessimistic model because of uh, it's a rather high empirical wolf a mass loss rate that is assumed there um, and at high uh, sort of high metallicities as well. So then the final thing that we can do is basically do this a bunch of times and figure out how often do we get merging binary black holes. And so what is plotted on the y-axis is kind of the efficiency of producing merging binary black holes um, per solar mass that we simulate, uh, as again, as a function of metallicity. Um, and we find sort of modest increases uh, in, in the rate uh, in this, this new model, whereas this pessimistic model suppresses the, the rate by kind of a factor of two, two or so. Um, that is kind of also shown in this figure, um, where in the histograms you can see the the difference in height is basically reflecting the the overall difference in in rate that I showed in the previous slide. Um, but there's also some kind of subtle differences in the the distributions as well. And one of the things we found, I've mostly focused on talking about binary black holes. Um, we basically found no real statistically significant differences. Um, for the populations of binary neutron stars or neutron star black hole mergers. So this is work that is being led by J.D. Merritt, a PhD student at the University of Oregon with Ben Farr. Um, uh, I'm kind of helping co-supervise that and then working with Andreas Sander, who's providing a lot of the kind of uh, theory on the, the wolf a stars. So that's everything I want to say. So. Massive stars have high mass loss rates throughout their lives in various evolutionary phases, including on the main sequence as red supergiants uh, and also as stripped Wolf-A stars. Um, we've basically 
done a literature survey of kind of the last five years and picked a bunch of modern mass loss rate prescriptions um, and implemented them in our rapid population synthesis code and used that to look at what impact this has on the, um, the evolution and formation of, of merging binary black holes. Um, I, I'll leave it there and take any questions. Thanks. Could Cygnus X1 have accreted some more mass from like a, an even more complicated system, like if it was triple originally or something? Yeah, so so this is probably not the best way to really show this because uh, um, so Cygnus X1 is clearly a binary, and um, so binary interactions probably important in in determining the the mass of the the black hole in that case. Um, I think it's unlike. I think it's basically believed that the black hole mass is the natal black hole mass to within you know uh, a fairly good approximation um, because it's hard to accrete a decent amount of mass on that. Um, uh, in that case, I don't think there's any suggestions that it could be or have been a triple, but maybe there's you know maybe there's no way we, that we would know. Um, uh, yeah, as far as I know, there's no discussion of that. Okay, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I was wondering how mass loss can affect the final rate, uh, final fate of the massive stars, like red supergiant stars, uh, to become a supernovae or a black hole, because there's uh, so-called red supergiant problems, that uh, there's no observational case of uh, bright red supergiant stars to be collapsing as a type 2p supernova. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's, yeah, I guess kind of tied to this, right? That, you know, if you have um, these higher mass loss rates for particularly these most, these highest mass um, red supergiants, then those will basically lose their envelope within the, the red supergiant phase um, and evolve back to the, the blue side of the HR diagram. And, and instead of dying as type 2p supernovae, they will you know, they will die as type 1bc. Um, uh, and so, yeah, maybe you you get a different population of, of supernova uh, progenitors. Um, the other possibility that people will discuss is that um, for these brightest um, red supergiants, that they may not have a sort of bright supernova at all, but you may have an almost complete collapse of the star just to a black hole. Um, and so in that case, you, you, you know, you don't see the supernova, um, for those, um, kind of brightest red supergiants. Um, I think, yeah, that's, um, some combination of those two is, is probably, um, yeah, it's probably where our models sort of suggest things, things are. Yeah. So thank you. Well, if not, I have a question. Mm -hmm. If we go back to Cygnus 61, do you have... Um, what do you think is missing from the models if it's not mass loss? Right. So, um, so I think in this case, yeah, I should, probably should have included a, a binary plot for, so this is really just for a population of single stars, um, and Cygnus X1 is, is not single. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I don't know, um. I think you, yeah, you have to be a bit more careful. One of the things that um, in these rapid population synthesis models um, is that the core masses of the stars that we get, I think, are kind of underpredicted relative to more detailed stellar models. Um, and so we've had some papers where we've kind of done some comparisons between, um, like, detailed MESA models and these rapid population synthesis models and find, you know, for certain assumptions that they can have kind of more massive cores. Uh, and so if you start out with a, a more massive helium core kind of post mass transfer, then even if you have a fairly high mass mass loss rate, you know, the star can still evaporate down, but it will still retain enough mass at the end that it can form a, mass enough, a massive enough uh, black hole to you know, produce a Cygnus X1 like system. Um so so I think probably my my money is on kind of basically that these stellar models are wrong in some way. Um, um but it could also be that we need to suppress the Wolf A mass loss rates even more than you know, this updated model suppresses the 
the Wolf Array mass loss rates by like a factor of three compared to the the previous model. Um, it could be that we need to go further, but that starts to be in tension with the theoretical models and and some observations. So I tend to disfavor that possibility. Um, but yeah, it's basically something to do with stellar models or mass loss rates. Thank you. Sounds like it's going to be a complicated solution. <laughs> Uh, I have seen this uh, this plot you saw it about the different mass loss rates uh, relations by different authors several times. This and, one. Yeah, this yeah. one. So I, I, I'm curious about why, what is the reason of so many, so large difference between different people? Because these are observed uh, mass loss rates, I guess, no? Yeah, this, I think... Oh, how can this be improved? Because I am a bit uh, curious. I think... These are all observational studies. So, I mean, one of the things is just the dates, right? So some of these are well, samples based on a handful of, of red supergiants observed 30 years ago huh. um, versus you know, thousands of red supergiants observed, you know, with the latest, uh, huh. uh, you know, instruments and techniques uh, in the last few years. So I think, you know, hopefully there's there's been some real significant progress in in the last 30 years. But even if you just compare, like on this slide, if you just compare all of these kind of prescriptions that people have come up with in the last few years, there's still significant discrepancies between what people are finding. And I mean, uh, Costos talked about this yeah. the other day as well. Like, I think, you know, some of that is due to like different assumptions that people make and different methods. Um, but, you know, I think that's still a kind of an open question okay. and, and needs to be understood really. Okay. That, you know, we would like people to converge yeah, on, yeah. on a, you know, agreeing okay. on what the answer is. Uh, okay, okay. We're not quite there yet, I think. Okay, thanks.